Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Art After Dark at Norton From Home. My name is Glenn Tomlinson, and I'm the William Randolph Hearst Curator of Education at the Museum. And it's my pleasure tonight to uh, introduce Lori Barnes, who will be discussing her installation, Divine Beings, China at the Center of Cross Currents in Asian Art. Lori Barnes is an art historian, whose scholarship has focused on Chinese ceramics and their impact on world cultures. I'm delighted to tell you that she's also the Elizabeth B. McGraw Curator of Chinese Art here at the Norton Museum of Art, where she's been our colleague since 2006. Among her many responsibilities at the Norton, Lori has enhanced and managed and uh, served as ambassador for the most important collection of Chinese art in the Southeastern United States, with strengths in areas of archaic jades and bronzes, as well as Qing Dynasty imperial jades. She's acquired over 70 works of art for the museum's collection, from ancient lacquerware to monumental Ming Dynasty paintings. Her research into the collection has resulted in over 25 thematic exhibitions and a host of complementary programs. And in that regard, I just want to say that it's been my pleasure to work with Laurie over these years uh, to develop uh, programs and festivals like the Chinese Moon Festival and the New Year's Festivals, which we celebrate each year. Prior to her work at the Norton, from 1989 to 2005, Laurie was at the Detroit Institute of the Arts as the assistant and then associate curator of Asian art there. Laurie received her Bachelor of Science in Art History and Studio Art at Harding University in Arkansas, and her MA in Chinese Art History from the University of Texas at Austin. She's also received fellowships for international study in Beijing, Taipei, and Seoul, and has authored numerous catalogs, essays, and articles, including articles on the reinstallation of the museum's uh, Chinese galleries for 2019's opening, uh, the special exhibition catalog for a beautiful exhibition entitled High Tea, Glorious Manifestations East and West in 2015. And she was also a major contributor to the authoritative publication, Chinese Ceramics, from the Paleolithic period to the Qing Dynasty, published by Yale University and the Foreign Languages Press in Beijing. Uh, due to technical difficulties, Lori will not be on camera tonight, uh, but she is live. She is narrating her presentation, and she will take your questions, any that you write into the chat uh, on your screen, uh, she'll be happy to address at the end of her presentation. Lori, we're delighted to have you with us tonight. Thanks for joining us, and welcome. Thank you, Glenn. This presentation highlights featured works of art included in Divine Beings, China at the Center of Cross Currents in Asian Art. This installation features works by Asian artists in response to spiritual concepts. Spotlighted are exceptional works, a Hindu sculpture from Bangladesh and Buddhist paintings from China, Korea, and Japan, as well as a Taoist painting. We hope that you will soon be able to visit the Norton and explore the relationships between these highlights and more than 30 selected works from the Norton's collection on view within five Chinese galleries. Some representations of Hindu, Buddhist, and Taoist gods and demigods take the form of humans, such as the three Taoist immortals of happiness, high salary, and long life. Others depict real or imaginary animals, such as the tiger and dragon, that possess supernatural ability. Within time-honored artistic and philosophical conventions, each artist has, sought, has thoughtfully given form to their beliefs about the fundamental nature of existence. Next slide, slide please. The majestic four-armed Hindu god Vishnu, protector and preserver of the universe, is sensitively modeled wearing a crown, jewelry, and a loincloth. He is seated in an animated yet stately pose on the shoulders of a burly winged Garuda in the guise of an aging atlas. Garuda is not only Vishnu's 
means of transportation, but also an, the enemy of snakes. One snake is coiled beneath his wings, and Garuda locks his gaze on a cobra near his free hand, which is raised in anticipation. The saga of Vishnu and Garuda's initial meeting recounts that Garuda agreed to be Vishnu's means of transport. Garuda was returning from the heavens where he rescued Vinada, his mother and the mother of all birds, from Kadru, mother of Nagas or serpents. The lasting enmity between Garuda and the serpents is attributed to the serpents enslaving his mother until he delivered the elixir of immortality to the serpents. Next slide, please. Both the fabulous and important Lake Gupta's terracotta sculpture works in this slide appeared on the market in 2009. At that time, farmers in Bangladesh began to sell choice objects. These works are now believed to have come from the ruins of Hindu sculptures that were embellished with terracotta sculptures. Next slide, please. These, the map on the upper left depicts the Gupta Empire at its height. Both the, the, the sculpture of Vishnu riding Garuda is from the Gupta period. The small Gupta kingdom began to expand its influence as it conquered nearby rivals and then set sites further afield and began conquest into southern India and north into territories of Afghanistan. The Gupta Empire became a wealthy regional power and an important place of where art and liter literature flourished and the center of the Hindu religion. The rulers of the Gupta Empire promoted Hinduism, but supported Buddhist practice as well. The Chinese Buddhist monk Fa Xin traveled extensively in the Gupta Empire from 399 to 412 to gather Buddhist texts and sacred images. The slide on the lower right shows uh, Bangladesh down in the, in the lower right-hand corner, but uh, areas where uh, the style that you see in the, uh, the Vishnu writing Garuda sculpture uh, flourished during the Gupta Empire. Next slide, please. This is a photograph of the temple at Bitagar Gon. Such temples were built to be dwellings for the gods. Such a decorated palace allowed priests to make offerings and in individuals to offer prayers, fl flowers, and food. They usually to a sacred relic or statue representing the indwelling god, which was housed in a relatively small and windowless architectural space. Believers could also walk around the temple in a ritual act of worship. Alexander Cunningham visited this place in 1877 and again in 1878. He found the temple in ruins and carried out repair work. He discovered a number of terracotta panels during this excavation around the temple the bricks discovered during this excavation was, were utilized in the restoration of the temple, which is seen in this photo. He sent at least two terracotta panels to the Indian Museum at Kolkata, which are still exhibited there. Next slide, please. In, photo, in these photographs from 1875 and 1878 by Joseph Belgar, which are now in the British Museum, one can see the substantial entrance porch, which uh, in the previous slide has been now been simplified. Most of this structure collapsed in 1894 after a lightning strike and was reconstructed as you've seen in the previous photo. There are many debates about the 
authenticity of, of much of the present structure. Next slide, please. This is a, a detail of the present stru structure of the temple at Bitaragon, showing some of the terracotta panels there. In India, clay has been in constant use and it's considered among the oldest building materials. To add longevity to objects or, or buildings being built using clay, fire ter clay or terracotta came into vogue. In East India, baked clay objects have been in regular use from ancient times. The art seen in small, uh, sculpted in small fig clay figures, clay sculptures in the round, but mo the most notable uh, works of art made of terracotta are plaques and roundels, like the roundel on loan to the Norton. Terracotta panels and friezes used as surf were used as surface decoration on brick buildings, particularly temples like this one at Bitaragon, and are remarkable contributions to Asian art. Next slide, please. During Alexander Cunningham's repairs to the temple at Bitaragon, he discovered a number of terracotta panels, one of which you see on the left. Some, such as the one on the left, uh, were used in the reconstruction of the temple site. At least two other panels were sent to the Indian Museum in Kolkata, Kolkata and are still exhibited there. Next slide, please. The, on the left is a terracotta panel in the Brooklyn Museum and, uh, where Vishnu rides Garuda into battle, uh, blowing his conch shell and holding what appears to be an archer's bow. Even, if, even in its current fragmentary condition, the relief captures the dynam dynamism of the scene. Garuda has is represented in a kind of a short kind of shorthand with just a head and wings. Next slide, please. Monument building during the late Gupta period focused on prayer halls and temples. Large circular tondo compositions are rare in Hindu contexts. The terracotta roundel in the center could well have come from the window on the lintel at the entrance to a shrine, which usually contains a circular composition. On the left is a roundel at the Hindu Yudagiri rock cut temples dating to the early years of the 400s. This roundel depicts a major another major Hindu god, Shiva, meaning auspicious one, and his consort, Parvati. The roundel on the right is a decorative element in Cave 26 at Ajanta, which is a Buddhist prayer hall carved from stone in 462. This cave's decorative and icon iconographic prototypes provided inspiration for Buddhist art of Tibet, Nepal, Central Asia, China, Japan, and Southeast Asia. Next slide, please. The Dagora temple constructed in the 500s depicts myths related to Vishnu. The photograph on the right shows a renowned panel from the north side of the temple depicting Vishnu rescuing the elephant Gajendra from, the, from a serpent or Naga, king and queen. Next slide, please. The, the figure on the left is a Vidyahara, literally wisdom holder. In India, Vid Vidyaharas are wind spirits who possess magical powers. They, they attended another major Hindu god, Shiva, and also appear in legends connected with the historical Buddha. 
they are considered Upa Divas or demigods. And I hope you can see that this Upa Diva and uh, um, his pose and the way his comp the way he's composed is quite similar um, to uh, the uh, Im the uh, composition for Garuda in the Roundel. Estimated to be about the same period of time, both late Gupta uh, terracotta sculptures. Next slide, please. This is a uh, gilt bronze finial um, of Garuda uh, from Tibet, um, made in the 1200s to 1300s. And it depicts Garuda as the king of birds and in a Tibetan Buddhist context where he becomes the ever watchful protector in Tibetan and Chinese Buddhist art. This Tibetan finial is expressively cast with a large beak and paws and with its curled wings outstretched with feathers rendered in elaborate foliage swirls. Next slide, please. Moving on from Tibet to China, this is a very famous monument outside Beijing. Um, and you can see at the top of this slide that Garuda is catching a pair of half-human, half-snake Nagarajas on the top of the south arch of the, this cloud platform which was completed circa 1342-1343 at Zhiyongguan near Beijing, China. The Zhiyongguan platform was originally the base for three Buddhist stupas containing the relics, containing relics in the Yongming Baoshang Temple. The Yuan Mongol rulers visited the temple twice a year en route from their upper capital, Shangdu, uh, which is now in ruins in Inner Mongolia, to the capital, the great capital, Dadu, which is now Beijing. The divine beings represented in the marble reliefs in the, are in the Sakya. Tibetan Buddhist style, and they were intended to bring blessings to those that passed through the passageway and to protect the Yuan state and its capital from misfortune. Next slide, please. This, we've now completed the uh, a brief investigation of the first uh, highlighted work in Divine Beings, and we're Moving on to the second, which also has origins in Indian art. And this is a Japanese painting that depicts the passage of the historical Buddha Shakyamuni from the cycle of life, death, and rebirth into Nirvana. The Buddha lies meditating on a platform beneath sacred trees. In the surrounding crowd are bodhisattvas. Buddhist monks, Hindu deities, men and women of every class, a multitude of animals, and even some mythical beast, including a tiger and a dragon, details of which are shown on the left and right. A full moon floats at the top of the hanging scroll. Buddhist sculptures, Buddhist scriptures state that Shakyamuni Buddha entered Nirvana under a full moon marking the beginning of the second month of the Hindu lunar calendar. This day occurred in 2020 on April 21st. Next slide, please. We know that the piece on loan to the Norton from the collection of Dora Wong uh, dates from about 1451 because of the existence of this painting with an inscription. And this painting is in the Koseji Temple in Kyoto. Um, as I, it is signed, a signed and dated painting depicting the historical Buddha passing into Nirvana. And uh, 
The artist, Tosa Yukihiro, was a leading artist in the Tosa school uh, from 1406 to 1451. As official painter to the imperial court and members of the military elite, he sought to keep the classic Japanese Yamatoe style of painting alive at a time when Zen Buddhist monochrome ink paintings, such as the tiger and dragon painting that will be examined next and are included in this installation were popular. There are elements in this painting that are uh, related, the painting at the Norton and this painting that are related to the Yamato style, one of which is the use of bright colors, use of gold, uh, and uh, this bird's eye view of the entire scene. Next slide, please. The subject of the passage of Shakyamuni Buddha into Nirvana has its origins in Gandharan Buddhist art of India and Pakistan of the 100s to 300s, as seen in the image on the left. In the center, the Parinirvana scene appears in the Buddhist cave 26 of the Janta. And we also saw a, a, a roundel, you'll remember, uh, from the Buddhist cave 26 of the Janta when we were discussing the uh, Hindu roundel. On the right is a detail of Tosa Yukihiro's painting uh, in the Yamatoe style. And as I mentioned before, you can note the use the Yamatai style made use of bright pigment and thick pigments, and uh, you can't see them here, but the bands of clouds to divide the space and the bird's eye view of the scene. Next slide, please. These two paintings are in the style that um, Tosa Yukihiro uh, was trying to re react against that were so popular in the uh, uh, 1400s in Japan. And uh, this is a, a tiger and a dragon in the style of the Chinese artist Mu Qi. And uh, one of the inscriptions on, the, uh, on, the, on these paintings is dated 1450. These monochrome ink paintings are precisely the style that was popular when Tosuyuki Hiro painted his painting of the passing of Shakyamuni Buddha into Nirvana, which dates circa 50, 1451. This pair of paintings reflects the swift, fluent, monochrome ink style of the unparalleled Chinese master of Zen Buddhist painting, the monk Mu Qi, who was active in China during the late 1200s. These 15th century paintings bear poetic inscriptions by the Chinese scholar Zhang Chun, who passed the Jin Shi examination in 1424 with the highest score. The Jin Shi examination, there's three levels of Chinese exams, and the Jin Shi is the highest one. Zhang Chun is believed to have acquired these paintings during his service as an imperial emissary to Korea. His poems allude to the dragon and tiger's supernatural abilities to control wind, rain and wind, respectively. Next slide, please. Here are um, a, a pair of paintings in the Cleveland Museum of Art that are attributed to Muchi, um, which was the inspiration for the tiger and dragon paintings on loan to the Norton. <clears throat> These paintings are attributed to Mu Qi and, the, and you can see Mu Qi's swift minimal, minimalistic monochrome style in these paintings, which embody the essence of Zen Buddhism, which is an amalgam of Buddhist and Taoist thought. This pair of paintings does not bear the, the artist's the Muchi's seal, but does bear 
collector's seals of Ashikaga Yoshimitsu, who was shogun in Japan from 1368 to 1394, and Ashikaga Yoshimasa, who was shogun, shogun from 1449 to 1473. So again, we see that this style of painting was very popular among the elite in the 1400s in Japan. And indeed, this style of painting was popular in Japan from the 1300s onwards. Next slide, please. This pair of paintings uh, depicting the tiger and the dragon is definitely by um, Muchi. And they are in the Daikokuji Temple in Kyoto. The inscription on the dragon painting reads, the dragon rises and causes clouds to appear. The inscription on the tiger painting is translated, the tiger roars and winds blow impetuously. It, the inscription, this inscription is followed by the date 1269 and the signature and seal of Mu Chi. Next slide, please. On the left is an 18th century Chinese copy of the Korean tiger painting on the right. Both are on view at the Norton when we will be on view at the Norton when we reopen. The copy is embellished with light color on paper, while the 15th century painting is executed in bold spontaneous gradations of black ink on silk. Next slide, please. This print on the left in the collection of the Norton Museum is based on, the, on Chinese paintings of a tiger licking his paw, such as the 13th century painting in the style of Mu Chi in the collection of the Cleveland Museum of Art, seen on the right. Mu Chi's tiger painting forms a pair with a dragon in clouds, as we have seen. The four line poem on this print by the Japanese artist Koryusai refers to the tiger's spiritual ability to control malevolent winds and assure, ensure plenty. Next slide, please. Um, Isoda Koryusai's inscription on this print of a dragon acknowledges, which is also on view in this installation at the Norton, acknowledges inspiration from the Chinese artist Yan Hui, who was active in the late 1200s to early 1300s. He was a younger contemporary of Mu Qi. Yan Hui is noted for his bold, rugged brushwork akin to Mu Qi's spontaneous abbreviated style. Next slide, please. Although no dragon paintings by Yan Hui are known to exist, famous extant works by Yan Hui depict the Taoist immortals Liu Hai Chan and his three-legged toad, which is seen on the left, and Iron Crutch Li, seen on the right. Yen Hui's work was not appreciated by Chinese connoisseurs in the 1300s, but were collected in Japan. These two hanging scrolls painted in the early 1300s are preserved in the Chionji, a Zen Buddhist temple in Kyoto, and are designated important cultural property in Japan. Next slide, please. Moving from the uh, Taoist paintings of immortals by Yan Hui uh, that we've just looked at, is this, we're moving to a Chinese painting of the 16th century by the artist Zhao Changguo of the three star lords of happiness, Fu Xing, high salary, Lu Xing, and long life, So Xing which are depicted in this, in this 
hanging scroll, and you can see them um, in the detail on the left side. Uh, two are engaged in the ancient strategy game of Wei Chi, which is known in Japan as Go and which is known in, in Korea as Baduk, while a third observes. Next slide, please. The ancient board games of Liu um, Bo, which was a gambling or divination game, and Wei Qi, which was a strategy game, are mentioned in Confucius's Analects, which was written in about 500 BCE. And I quote from the Analects, a translation of the Analects, I should say. It is difficult for a man who always has his stomach full to put his mind to some use. Are not are not players, are there not players of Liu Bo and Wei Qi? Even playing these games is better than being idle. On the, on the left-hand side, you can see a really magnificent uh, Liu Bo game board made of stone about 2,300 years ago, and above that are two are some immortals playing the game of Liu Bo in a, a stone relief carving, and on the right is a uh, a Wei Qi game uh, which uh, was made in circa 756 and is preserved in the Shosuin Treasure House in um, Japan, and it was brought back. Uh, from China, pro, pro, definitely a gift from the court, perhaps the emperor of China to the emperor of Japan. And above you see uh, roughly 1,900-year-old uh, images of Wei Qi being played um, by humans. Um, a slightly later anthology than Confucius's Analects uh, an anthology of poem written about 2,300 years ago entitled Chu Su, or Lyrics of the State of Chu, mentions the Taoist immortals Qi Song and Wang Chao engaging in two pursuits, playing Wei Qi and the Qin, a type of Chinese zither. And I mentioned that you see the, the Liu Bo game and Wei Qi game being played on these, uh, above these uh, game, games uh, from pictorial bricks and relief carvings from roughly 1900 years old. Um, the game of Wei Qi, uh, the game of Liu Bo died out. And, um, but the game of Wei Qi was later continues to this day and is particularly popular in East Asia and was incorporated into four accomplishments that a Confucian scholar was expected to master. Next slide, please. Um, the artist Zhao Changguo's inscriptions state on the painting that's on view from the collection the Norton's collection of immortals playing Wei Qi, uh, his inscription on that painting states that he was copying a work by Dai Jin. And Dai Jin lived from thir circa 1388 to 1462, and he's considered the patriarch of the Zhe school of professional painting. To this day, representations and references to Taoist, the Taoist immortals of happiness, high salary, and long life are commonly encountered in China, Japan, and Korea. Next slide, please. The earliest known painting of the three star lords of happiness, high salary, and long life dates to about 1350 and is seen in this slide. The earliest literary work about these Taoist immortals was, was was a play by Zhu Yudun, who was a grandson of the founder of the Ming Dynasty. In this play titled, Festival of the Immortal Officials, Fu, Lu, and Shou, 
the immortals descend to Earth to celebrate the Lunar New Year. Today, and perhaps in the 1500s, when Zhao Changbo created this painting, images of the three star lords are displayed during Chinese New Year celebrations because, according to the playwright Zhu Youduan, it is their duty to confer happiness, high salary, and long life. Next slide, please. As mentioned previously, Wei Qi is considered one of the four arts of the Confucian scholar gentleman. From the 16th century onward in Japan, the four accomplishments, uh, which are mastery of calligraphy, which is seen on the left, then moving on to mastery of painting, and then playing the Wei Qi, uh, uh, playing the Qin, and then lastly on the left, playing Wei Qi, were popular subjects among painters. So the at the top of the screen, you see these four uh, details from the screens below of the four accomplishments, uh, uh, from the pair of screens below of the four accomplishments. As, as I've just mentioned, on these screens, the scholars are engaged in these cultured activities. These skills had been a requirement of life in the Japanese imperial court since the Heian period, which lasted from 794 to 1185, and were assimilated by the ascendant warrior class beginning in the late 1100s. The artist, Kaio Yusho, painted this pair of screens, which shows the influence of 13, the 13th century, century Zen monk monochrome ink painters previously mentioned in the discussion of the tiger and dragon paintings. Yu Shou's major patrons include the Japanese warlord Toyotomi Hideyoshi, uh, who lived from 1537 to 1598, and the emperor Go Yose, who reigned from 1586 to 1611. Next slide, please. This slide is a album leaf painting showing two scholars playing Wei Qi, and it's it's as it's one in an album of several leaves. Um, it was painted by Yi Kyung Yun. He was a member of the Korean royal family. His father was the eleventh son of King Sonjo who ruled from 1449 to 1494. The album depicts contemplative and cultured activities embraced by Korean Confucian scholars in the late 1500s, such as playing Aichi, which is seen here, and the zither, which is seen in another album leaf in this set. Like the Chinese painter of the Immortals playing Wei Qi in the mountains, Zhao Changguo, Yi Yong Yun's style was influenced by the Chinese Zhu school master, Dai Jing. Aspects of Dai's style seen in this album leaf are the dividing of the composition diagonally and the strong contrast of black ink on a light silk ground. Next slide, please. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation spotlighting featured works in Divine Beings, China at the Center of Cross Currents in Asian Art. This and other programs at the Norton Museum of Art would not be possible without the support of the Friends of Chinese Art. If you like Chinese art, please consider becoming a member of the Friends of Chinese Art. With this, I will turn the program, uh, I will open up the program for uh, questions and I'll be happy to try to answer. Thank you very much.
I'm looking uh, at, at questions now. Um, uh, one question is, uh, were there a, a lot of other types of trade and exchange between China and Japan? Oh, of course. <laughs> I, I mean, there, there were philosophical ideas exchanged, ceramics. I mean, some of the, I mean, some of the three color wares from the Tang Dynasty, uh, which you know was the, the Tang Dynasty three color ware that was so popular in tombs, and you can see examples of it in the Norton collection, and that. Um, type of wear was popular in tombs to about, I think 755, but then because of the internal unrest, unrest in China, tombs started to be less opulently furnished. But then they, because they were so popular elsewhere, including Japan, they started to be exported and, and archeological excavations in Japan, even from that early, and, and tea culture, there was back and forth between monks, uh, not only for Buddhist texts, but tea culture. Um, so there's, there's lots, I mean, there's a reason they call China the great mother culture in East Asia, which includes China, Korea, and Japan. And, and really in Southeast Asia too. I mean, it's, uh, and that's one reason I did this exhibition you know was just to i mean it's been millennia that that these exchanges have gone on uh, from india along the silk road to china korea and japan um uh, another question is what made me explore this subject in this subject as an exhibition? There are lots and lots of uh, images of divine beings, both in human form and in animal form. And, and you know, like in this painting of, of the uh, Parnirana of the, the, the historical Buddha passing into Nirvana, you see all of these animals, which are really, um, even, even Dora Wong said, I, I didn't buy this painting because I knew it, it, because I didn't know it was a great masterwork of, of Japanese painting by an important master. I, I'm just a lover of animals. <laughs> and it was a really great animal painting, so I bought it. And then uh, yeah, it, the, the underbidder for the painting when she bought it, borrowed it for an exhibition. And then she learned that, that it was by Tosa Yukihiro and it was a really important painting. And, it, and so what I wanted to do with this exhibition was borrow pieces and exhibit pieces from our collection that allowed me to explore this subject of spirituality and some of the other objects in in our collection like oxes dragons tigers they're everywhere i mean and but i wanted to get some really spectacular pieces to highlight and then encourage people to explore further um, and you know one thing we're going to be doing online is, is pro I'm probably going to be uh, writing some blogs where you'll be able to see some of the pieces uh, actually in our collection that relate to these highlights that I've discussed tonight. Well, I don't, I'm not seeing any other questions. So, I am going to turn the program over to Glenn to close. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Laurie.
Thank you so much for, for uh, providing that wonderful context to uh, these terrific loans that are on view. And uh, as Lori said at the beginning of her talk, we do look forward to uh, having the chance to share them with you again soon. Uh, and we uh, hope that that, that, that will, uh, uh, we will be able to uh, let you know about that uh, in the in very, uh, very near future. Um, until then, our programs will remain uh, online virtually, and we look forward to uh, sharing them with you uh, throughout the fall and winter. Um, and and I, I wanted to uh, remind our, our listeners to visit Norton from Home, I'm sorry, uh, Norton.org uh, to see the Norton from Home page and all of the different programs that we have coming up. I did want to just mention one. Uh, that will be featured next Friday, November 13th at 7 p.m. And uh, this also relates to an installation that is uh, currently on view, and we hope you'll see again soon, uh, the uh, exhibition of Robert Rauschenberg's work from the Whitney Museum of American Art. Uh, the program next Friday at 7 p.m. is called Robert Rauschenberg and Oral History. And it features Sarah Sinclair, who is the project manager and lead interviewer for the Robert Rauschenberg Oral History Project at the Columbia Center for Oral History Research. In conversation with Cheryl Brutvan, our director of curatorial affairs and our Bailey curator of contemporary art, they'll be joined by Donald Saff, an artist who collaborated with Rauschenberg uh, during his career. Uh, so we look forward to that conversation again next Friday. If you would like to register for that, the program is free. Just just visit our website at www.norton.org and you'll be able to uh, register right there, very simply. Uh, well, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thanks again to Lori Barnes for a marvelous talk. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at the Norton again very soon. Take care.